Nursing Education. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Balonic, and I'm Nursing Education at the IOL. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Charles Namaroff. Um, I was fortunate enough to hear Dr. Namaroff speak at the Harvard Master's in Psychopharmacology program a few years ago. And I recall when I first heard him speak on this topic in Boston, I actually caught myself sitting in the audience with bumps and my jaw dropped. It was one of the most impressive presentations I had ever heard. And I have been on a quest to get him to return here to Harvard to give this very presentation since. And the day has finally arrived. There's a lot of introductory comments. Dr. Namaroff is very accomplished, but I will try to keep them brief. Dr. Namaroff received his medical degree and doctor degrees in neurology from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And he has since been named the alumnus of the year from both the University of North Carolina and from the Nor University of North Carolina Medical School. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. Dr. Namaroff is currently the professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Dell Medical School, University of Texas at Austin. He also directs the Institute of Early Life Adversity Research within the Department of Psychiatry as part of the Mulville Clinic for the, for the Neurosciences. And I just want to add that I heard him speak on that topic of early life adversity oh, about a summer ago, and it was really wonderful. So I put a plug in to actually invite him back on that topic. Prior to joining the Dell Medical School, Dr. Namaroff was chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the clinical director of the Center on Aging at the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine, Miami, Florida. He was also elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2002. Dr. Namaroff is a member of the APA Council on Research and chairs both the APA Research Colloquium for Young Investigators and the APA Workgroup on Biomarkers and Novel Treatments. Among his research interests is the pathophysiology of mood and anxiety disorders with a focus on the role of child abuse and neglect as a major risk factor, and also the role of mood disorders as a risk factor for major medical disorders, including heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, the very topic that we are going to hear today. Dr. Namaroff has published more than 1,100 research reports and reviews, and his research is currently supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health. He's also served on the, Med the Mental Health Advisory Council for National Institute of Medi Mental Health and the Biomedical Research Council. He's the co-author in chief, along with Dr. Alan Schatzberg of the textbook of psychopharmacology published by the APA Press and is now in his fifth edition. He's the co-editor in chief of a new journal published by Elsevier, Personalized Medicine and Psychiatry. Dr. Nemiroff has received a number of research and educational awards, really too numerous to mention here. I finally want to add that Dr. Namaroff is the president-elect of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And I may also note that he is the past recipient of the Distinguished Berlin Game Award, awarded by the Institute of Living. It's with great pleasure, and finally, Dr. Namaroff, to have you here on this topic. His presentation today will be called The Interface of Medical and Psychiatric Disorders, the Focus on Cancer and Heart Disease. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Namaroff. Well, Chuck, Cynthia, I wish my children heard me uh, heard you introduce me. Uh, you were too kind. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, I really like the Institute of Living, and you know, they've been great to me over the years, uh, uh, bestowing the Burlingame Prize on me. I have had close relationships with many people in your um, area, including. Uh, the folks at UConn, uh, Dave Steffens was one of my residents uh, at Duke, um, although I take no credit for his success. Andy Winokur, a great friend, and of course, many colleagues, uh, Grayson, of course, uh, and of course, colleagues at Yale. So I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I'm gonna hold Cynthia to the invitation to come back uh, when we're done with the madness of the pandemic, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, I've got lots of information to talk to you about. This is in my mind, a really exciting topic. And it's not one that's talked about very often. And that has to do with the interface of medical disorders and psychiatric disorders. This is a very large topic and I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of the remarkable uh, um, uh, sub areas that are subsumed under this topic. And that's why I've decided to focus on cancer and heart disease, two very common medical disorders. Here are my uh, disclosures. Uh, my research is only supported by NIH 
I've consulted to a number of, of companies over the past um, a year and have uh, served on a number of nonprofit boards as well. So first, let me start off and give you just a quick um, overview of our current view uh, of all of complex medical disorders, ranging from diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and psychiatric disorders. So at the bottom of the slide is a lifeline from birth to death. And this very odd y-axis is called organ integrity. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. So Western medicine is focused all the way on the right hand of this slide, which is patients come to us when they're sick. They're psychotic, they're depressed, they're suicidal, they're jaundiced, they're in pain. And we make a diagnosis uh, to the best of our ability, either medically or otherwise, and then we treat the patients, right? And um, how's that working for us? Well, it doesn't work really well in some circumstances because by the time we see the patients who are symptomatic, they have an impairment of organ integrity, right? If they have Alzheimer's disease, their brain is filled with plaques and tangles. If they've been drinking for 30 years, they have alcoholic encephalopathy uh, and so on and so forth. So all of medicine is moving to the left here where we want to identify at-risk groups of, of individuals. You know, who's really at risk for developing major depression, PTSD, my current, uh, one of my current um, foci in research is trying to determine, you know, who are the 30% of people who develop PTSD after trauma? Why do 60% of people do not develop PTSD? And can we identify that with genomic markers or imaging markers or other, other characteristics about patients? So if we could identify an at-risk group, um, then we would be able to target them and begin to actually practice preventative psychiatry, right? And at the very least, intervene before their first psychotic episode or manic episode or depressive episode. So why I'm not advancing my slides. This happens on occasion. Oh, there we go. Okay. It was a little slow on the uptake. So this is an important slide because it organizes for you the various possible um, possibilities in the relationship between medical disorders and psychiatric disorders. In this case, I'm using depression as the prototype. So at the very top, um, one can have a medical illness like heart disease and um, a psychiatric illness like depression, and it can be a coincidence. It could be true, true, and unrelated. But there are many other possibilities for this relationship. So we might treat someone with a medical disorder and that treatment in and of itself can result in depression. The best example is the use of interferon for the treatment of um, uh, malignant melanoma. We used to use it for hepatitis C. We don't anymore because we have Harvoni. But it very clearly, folks that were never depressed before treated with interferon became terribly depressed. And we also know other medications can precipitate depression in vulnerable individuals. We also know that the treatment of depression can result in medical disorders. The best example is the use of atypical antipsychotics that result in obesity and metabolic syndrome and the emergence of type two diabetes. Um, using conventional antipsychotics or drugs like risperidone can reveal uh, um, um, uh, pituitary microadenomas, when we see patients that end up with large prolactin elevations, uh, galactorrhea, um, and, and, and there are other examples uh, of this as well. Um, there could be a purely behavioral relationship, right? Where um, if you're depressed, you end up not exercising. 
and you end up having a poor diet um, and you maybe smoke more than the general population, and then you're much more likely to develop heart disease, right? And, and we know this to be the case. We also know that, that there may be, and I'm gonna harp on this during the presentation, that there may be convergent biology that results in an increase in risk for a medical disorder because of the biology of depression or the risk of depression because the biology of cancer uh, or, or heart disease, which we'll talk about um, subsequently. So an example would be um, uh, the fact that <clears throat> many neurological disorders have high rates of depression due to the brain changes that occur um, associated with Parkinson's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis and stroke um, would be one example. Another example would be for the biology to be shared. And as you'll see in a moment, um, many complex medical disorders and depression show a common um, um, uh, abnormality in the immune system to wit a increase in inflammation. So that we know this occurs in certain forms of cancer and heart disease. We know that about 20 to 25% of depressed patients show an increase in inflammatory markers. And, and that may end up um, uh, being the reason for the high rates of comorbidity between these disorders. And then of course, there may be a shared genetic risk since we know that all complex medical and psychiatric disorders do have a, a heritable component of risk. And then lastly, the, the, all the psychosocial factors. So there was recently a study done showing that um, if you're um, uh, someone who's living in a, um, um, in a socially, um, a, a lower socioeconomic class environment, you're not only um, susceptible as we all are to childhood adversity in the form of child abuse and neglect, but it turns out you're also gonna be exposed to higher rates of air pollution. And that in itself is gonna result in increases in inflammation that actually are associated with both depression and other medical disorders like asthma, um, uh, et cetera. So this is a slide that's meant to uh, convince you that patients with medical disorders have much higher prevalence rates of depression. So this is not a hard sell because here's the point prevalence rate of depression in the general population, all the way at the left, it's about five and a half to 6%. And then you're looking at um, um, a group of disorders um, uh, uh, that are uh, relevant to this presentation. So here's cancer in turquoise and various forms of cancer, I'm gonna describe this in much more detail, have inordinately higher rates of, of comorbid depression than the general population. Not all cancers, like colorectal cancer does not, but a number of others do. Um, and pancreatic cancer has the highest rate and it's not actually shown there. Then here are cardiovascular disorders, including post-myocardial infarction, heart failure, hypertension, um, and you see those rates are remarkably high in the 25 to 30% range for comorbid depression. Here are um, neurological disorders. Um, and finally, um, uh, autoimmune disorders or disorders of inflammation like um, uh, lupus, um, irritable bowel syndrome, psoriasis, et cetera. So this is an old literature, um, just to convince you that um, this has been confirmed over and over and over again, that depressed patients, uh, that cancer patients have higher rates of major depression. And when I was a third year medical student, um, my very first rotation was, um, was gynecological oncology. And there was a woman um, who I was assigned to who was getting treated uh, for endometrial cancer. 
And in those uh, days, um, the treatment was the insertion of cesium or radioactive rods, um, and, and the patient would have to be in, in the hospital in bed for 72 hours. So as a medical student, I got to spend time with this patient and she was morbidly depressed. And I went to the attending and I said, um, you know, I presented the case. We talked about the treatment. And I said, I'd like to start her on an antidepressant. And he looked at me and he said, well, Mr. Nemiroff, uh, I guess you would, but we're not gonna waste the, the insurance company's money or the state's money to treat this patient. All cancer patients are depressed and we're not gonna do that which catapulted me into doing um, several treatment studies of depression uh, in the cancer population, showing that no, not all cancer patients are depressed. And if you treat cancer patients for depression with psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy, lo and behold, they get better. So this was a very early study <clears throat> um, that reported uh, uh, depression <clears throat> at baseline, actually being a risk factor for the development uh, of cancer. This was an old study. There are a lot of things that matter with it. It was fundamentally an epidemiologic study. <clears throat> but there have been a lot of studies since then. And I'm going to whip through this because I want to bludgeon you um, into believing that this is a profound relationship. So <clears throat> this is a study of almost 600 women with early stage breast cancer that was, uh, they were enrolled in a, in a prospective survival study. After five years, uh, almost 400 were still alive and without relapse, 50 were alive with relapse, 133 had died. And what was the significant factor uh, in terms of increased risk of death? it was high depression scores. So this, this was um, not only the depression scores on standardized rating scales, but in particular, their measures of hopelessness and helplessness. <clears throat> um, another study looking at uh, uh, women with breast cancer showed that those that were without external stressors had much higher survival rates than those that had uh, encountered a stressful-like event. And, and the lowest were those that had um, actually experienced a traumatic life event. And so this is the group from Ohio State <clears throat> collaborating with the Stanford group, showing that if you follow patients over time in a naturalistic way, and follow their depression scores from baseline over time, those that showed the greatest decrease in depressive symptoms had the highest survival rates. So the median survival was, was literally um, uh, four and a half years for women with decreasing depression scores over the course of a year, uh, and only 25 months for those with increasing depression scores. So we've got to start asking ourselves, why is this the case? This is a relatively recent study um, looking at women with cervical cancer. Um, and so you could see here um, uh, that this was a study of 4,200 of patients with newly diagnosed cervical cancer, and they had measures of psychological distress which fundamentally is depression and anxiety. And there was a very clear association between um, uh, uh, the pre-diagnosis level of uh, depression and anxiety and, um, and mortality rates after diagnosis. Uh, obviously ovarian cancer is one of the most uh, worrisome of all uh, uh, women's reproductive uh, cancers. This is a study from the a very large nurses um, uh, health study, Roman number two, uh, looking at 54,000 subjects. 110 women um, had ovarian cancer diagnosed, 
those with the highest PTSD symptoms actually had a twofold greater risk of developing ovarian cancer. So we're talking about vulnerability to disease, um, as well as um, talking about um, um, treatment course. This is a study looking at the effect of depression before breast cancer diagnosis on mortality in postmenopausal um, depressed women. And what you see here is that depression at three years prior to a breast cancer diagnosis was actually associated with an increase in mortality, um, even after adjusting for multiple uh, covariance. So that's a, a pretty remarkable um, finding. Okay, why doesn't my slide want to advance here? Why are you being difficult? Every once in a while, when I give grand rounds by um, by Zoom, I have to um, leave and then come back in with the presentation. So I think I'm probably going to have to do that. Let's see if just trying it again will work here. Okay, this is um, the only animal study I'm gonna show you, which is uh, a study by a Nobel laureate, Martha McClintock. And I just, it was too profound for me not to show you. This is a study that took um, uh, rodents, um, rats, that were implanted with mammary tumors and half of the rodents were kept in isolation mimicking loneliness and social isolation, and half were kept um, in a group setting. And what we found, they found in this study, was that the mammary tumor burden among the social isolates increased to 84 times that of the controls, and that the disease was much more virulent. And it suggested um, that social isolation and psychosocial stress um, really has an adverse effect on outcome. Oh, Lordy. Okay. Sorry about this. if I can get this going better. So this is um, two of the most important studies I'm gonna show you because it's clinically something that we don't think about enough. And that has to do with the fact that the diagnosis of cancer is associated with a remarkably high risk of suicide. And it's not something psychiatrists, oncologists, or, or general practitioners, uh, or any other mental health professionals think about. So this was a remarkable first study that looked at this question. <clears throat> so this was a study of uh, 1,400 New Jersey residents who were enrolled in Medicare, and 128 of those folks died to suicide. Uh, so the controls were 1,280. And the only medical condition that was associated with suicide uh, by far was a recent diagnosis of cancer. This is a, um, uh, a remarkable study that was published in JAMA Psychiatry, looking at the other end of, a, of the spectrum which is looking at 4.7 million patients with cancer in the National Health Service. And of those patients, about 2,500 had died by suicide. And it turns out that being given a diagnosis of cancer 
was a remarkable high risk of, of suicide. You can see that a four and a half fold increase in risk compared to the general population. If you were diagnosed with mesothelioma, followed by pancreatic cancer, almost a fourfold risk, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, uh, et cetera. And this risk is in the first six months after diagnosis. So if you look at the data here and look at different kinds of cancer, and then look at the standardized mortality rate, realizing, realizing that 1.0 would be no difference, you see this remarkable high rate of suicide. This is not suicide attempts. This is completed suicides. It is huge in the patients with oral uh, uh, and pharyngeal cancer, uh, esophageal cancer, uh, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, and so on and so forth. And even in cancers that are relatively easily treated, like prostate cancer, there remains a high, a, a high risk. Um, here's yet another study uh, that was conducted in 8.6 million uh, patients from what's called the SEER study, Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program, 1973 to 2014. And what you see here remarkably is a 4.44 increase in the mortality rate uh, for suicide in patients with cancer compared to the general population. Remember, um, cancer remain, uh, a suicide remains the number 10 cause of death in the United States. It's not an infrequent event, unfortunately. And this is four times that. And you can see the cancers that in particular, who are the biggest risk? Elderly white men. Um, and you know, I've seen many of these patients who fundamentally have said to me, well, I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. They're gonna to have to do surgery. I'm probably gonna be impotent and incontinent. I'm not really gonna be a man anymore. I'm a burden on my family. I'm gonna get worse. Life has no meaning. So I try to kill myself. Okay, that's the cognitive distortions associated um, with, um, with um, um, depression that we see in the cancer population. Um, this is another study that reported in all forms of cancer that depression actually, um, again, produced elevated mortality. And these are the effect sizes in the different studies, but the black bars are uncontrolled studies, the white bars controlled studies. Um, these are the effect sizes. So you see uh, they're all above zero. So why is this the case? Why is there a relationship between depression um, and cancer? Um, and is it a bi-directional relationship? And so many of us have conceived um, depression uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder um, as to some extent a stress response that's gone awry. And we also know that the immune system is intimately involved in stress responsiveness, as well as in the pathophysiology of mood and anxiety disorders. So let me digress and show you a little bit about the immune system. There's more and more data that cytokines, inflammatory cytokines are elevated uh, in, in the plasma of patients with depression that in and of itself is a whole presentation. But as a fourth year medical student, after I had that experience that I told you about, I did this study at the University of North Carolina in which I measured the plasma levels of, of an inflammatory cytokine that turns out to be the one that's most elevated in depressed patients. And this was the first study ever done looking at IL-6 levels, interleukin-6, in 10 healthy controls, 12 depressed patients. You see many of them show elevations. 
13 cancer patients without depression, only one showed an elevation, and then eight cancer patients with syndromal depression. And we reported this in the American Journal of Psychiatry, um, uh, uh, reporting uh, this increase in this inflammatory cytokine in depression and in depression and cancer. So there's a huge literature now that I'm trying to summarize for you on a couple of slides. It turns out in depression alone, without cancer, there is a relationship between severity of depression and the magnitude of inflammatory biomarkers, like interleukin-6 tumor necrosis factor, that patients who tend to be treatment resistant to both pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy tend to have the highest levels of inflammatory markers. When we treat patients um, with, uh, in, to intentionally increase their inflammation, as in using interferon alpha to treat uh, malignant melanoma, we see that many patients become clinically depressed and laboratory animals show um, the cardinal changes uh, in depression uh, as well. Um, and then um, uh, uh, lastly, um, if we have time, there's some evidence that, that treatment of depressed patients with inflammation uh, with anti-inflammatory agents might have antidepressant properties. So this is a study that we did some years ago on the left uh, showing uh, the stress-induced increase in interleukin-6 that we saw in these men with depression who also had a history of childhood maltreatment compared to the control men who did not. So you see this robust inflammatory response. So we've been very interested in, in this whole issue of what about the biology of depression uh, that might uh, create a more fertile environment for cancer, and, and as you'll see later, heart disease. So this is a wonderful review article that came out in Nature Medicine a couple of years ago, describing um, um, a physiological state called low-grade systemic chronic inflammation. And it can be brought about by a number of factors, including disrupted sleep, and poor nutrition, obesity is associated with increases in inflammation, um, physical inactivity. Um, and we know that, that this chronic inflammatory state is also found in a number of disorders, including depression, but also cancer, heart disease, um, uh, certain neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. So <clears throat> getting to the question of what is it about depression that might actually uh, bode poorly for cancer, this is a study that was, that was done uh, looking at whether uh, depressive symptoms associated with changes in cortisol actually had effect on survival uh, in, um, in renal cell carcinoma and whether that was related to um, inflammation. So these were 217 patients with renal cell carcinoma. Uh, their depression was measured with the Center for Epidemiological Study uh, depression scale, uh, and their cortisol uh, secretion was measured by serial salivary cortisols. And they found that very clearly um, their depression severity and their cortisol rhythmicity was associated with decreased survival. And when they looked at um, uh, what gene variations might be associated uh, with this um, um, uh, phenomenon, um, it was all about pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, gene expression, as well as certain um, uh, pro-metastatic genes. Um, and my, one of my favorite genetic polymorphisms that's associated with an increase in risk for depression and PTSD uh, after individuals have been exposed to early life trauma turn out to also confer vulnerability 
to anxiety and depression in patients with advanced gastric cancer. Uh, really a remarkable study uh, that was just uh, published relatively frequently. So this is an example of what I talked about earlier uh, uh, about the idea of a shared genetic vulnerability. So, come on. Here we go. Um, this was a very simple study done looking at basal cell carcinoma and stressful life events. It was a really amazing study because it, 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 it involved several of my favorite topics, um, childhood emotional maltreatment, um, and trying to determine whether the persistent inflammatory um, um, <clears throat> uh, response that we see in adults that were victims of child abuse and neglect, whether that plays a role um, in mounting a response to um, invasion with a tumor. And in this case, it was um, uh, basal cell carcinoma. So in that study, which was done um, at a university-based medical center. Um, they reported that both maternal and paternal emotional maltreatment of the individuals was associated in combination with the more recent life stressor, a poorer immune response to a basal cell carcinoma. So, you know, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here, but I just want you to get a feeling for what I'm trying to convince you of. There's another study of 90 cancer patients, uh, different kinds of cancer assessed with a hospital anxiety and depression scale. And what did they find? Childhood trauma and recent life events were risk factors for higher depression uh, scores um, uh, and higher CRP levels, a measure of inflammation, higher tumor necrosis uh, factor scores. Um, as well. What about treatment? There are very little uh, in the way of controlled studies of treatment. This is a study with an antidepressant available in Europe, not in the United States. Um, myansarin, which is related to mirtazapine, a drug that is available in the United States. And you do see this um, um, a beneficial effect uh, on the treatment of depression. This is a really cool finding because what this shows is that if you are treating patients with depression who also have cancer, um, <clears throat> adherence to antidepressant medications is actually associated with an improvement in mortality. So how cool is that? So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a four year study of more than a million patient years. And the bottom line is the patients who uh, were on antidepressants were the ones who had a much uh, better survival rate than those who didn't. So I thought that was pretty remarkable. So it's not just good for their depression, but it's good, it's good for their survival. So I'm going to have like an episode here if I can't get this to be working. Okay, so now I'm gonna to shift to heart disease in the little bit of time I have left. And one of my favorite uh, quotes is at the bottom of the page, which is a quote from William Harvey, who um, discovered the nature of the circulation. In 1628, he said, every affectation of the mind that is attended with either pain or pleasure, hope or fear, um, uh, is the cause of an agitation whose influence uh, extends uh, to, the, to the heart. And, you know, you all know about um, our concepts of heartache and heartbreak, right? We're, we're familiar with these concepts. Oh, well, let me just stop sharing my screen here. So what I'm gonna convince you of in the little time that I have left is that everything I told you about cancer is even more true for heart disease. So 
Number one, that um, there's a very high rate of depression in patients with ischemic heart disease, that depression is a risk factor for developing heart disease, and it's also a risk factor for a poor outcome, both in terms of morbidity and mortality, if you've had an MI. I'm gonna convince you that the state of depression is associated with biological changes that increase risk for um, uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, and other cardiac uh, disorders, and that SSRIs are effective uh, uh, antidepressants in this population. So there are the risk factors for heart disease that you're all familiar with. Um, that's an ugly looking plaque in a obviously post-mortem uh, uh, coronary artery. Um, there are all the risk factors and I'm gonna convince you that depression is as big a risk factor. And the story starts <clears throat> in the early nineties when this fellow, Robert Anda, walks into my office when I was at Emory and says, hey, what do you think about this? I've got this data, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know anything about depression. He said, but guess what? Turns out that in this study of normal individuals without heart disease, who we followed for 12 years, that it turns out depressed mood and hopelessness are the major predictors of whether one develops fatal or non-fatal ischemic heart disease. And this is one of the slides I want you to really remember because what you're looking at at the bottom is, is a measure of hopelessness, right? Level of hopelessness from none to extreme. And this is a measure of risk for fatal in green or non-fatal ischemic heart disease in these subjects over 12 years. And this is a dose response relationship. So if you think of hopelessness as a, a proxy for depression severity, you can see how important depression is in, 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 in relationship to, to heart disease. This was the study that sort of got, got the whole field off the ground. It was done at Montreal General Hospital in which 222 patients post MI were interviewed seven days after their MI and then they were followed naturalistically. And this was the startling finding published in JAMA that the mortality rate of the, 30, of the 35 depressed patients was 16% over six months, and the 187 non-depressed patients, it was about 5.5%. And they were pretty evenly matched for severity of heart disease. So then they followed them for another year, and look at the data here. 20% of the patients a year and a half after their index MI were dead, from coronary fatalities, whereas only 6% of the non-depressed patients were. And again, look at this dose-response relationship. The more depressed you are, as assessed by your Beck depression inventory, look at how high your mortality rate is. It was 25%, almost 28% for those with a Beck score above 19. This is why when we treat depressed patients, we need to treat them to remission. This is not only true of myocardial infarction, it's true of coronary artery bypass surgery. Depression is the major risk factor for mortality. It's also the major risk factor if you follow patients over two years who have stable coronary artery disease and measure their major adverse cardiac events such as MI, cardiac arrest, needing revascularization. Look at how interesting this is. This is generalized anxiety disorder and GAD and MDD is major depressive disorder. Look at the major adverse cardiac events. Um, about 11%, 12% for those who have no depression or anxiety and about almost 30% for those with one or both 
a depression or anxiety diagnosis. In fact, this study of people 60 years or older actually demonstrated that with each increment in depression severity, you have an increased risk of, of cardiac and, and cerebrovascular death. This was a study of 4,300 plus individuals in what was called the SHEP study. And you see at the bottom, it says a 25% increased risk of death for every five unit increase in the Center for Epidemiological Studies depression score. Um, why I reproduced that slide. This is a study of physicians, male physicians that graduated John Hopkins. So this is pretty interesting, right? This is a seminal study which followed 1,190 men because in those years, Hopkins between 1948 and 1964 admitted relatively few women. That's thankfully finally changed. And the question is, is was clinical depression in your lifetime a risk factor of heart disease? They followed these men for 40 years. The mean incidence of depression was 12%. And it turned out that it was the major risk factor for coronary heart disease, even for controlling for obesity, cholesterol, smoking, or family history, it doubled your risk for myocardial infarction um, and, and coronary heart disease. Even if you had a depression 10 years before, it still resulted in an increase in risk. This relationship of depression and Poor outcome is also true for folks getting cardiac valve surgery, published in one of my very favorite journals, not the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. And it may be that part of this relationship has to do with the effects of childhood adversity, because as you know, um, uh, children exposed to sexual, physical, and emotional abuse and neglect um, have higher rates of depression, and we also know they have higher rates of ischemic heart disease. So this is a, a big effect. Whether this mediates the uh, uh, facts that, uh, factors, whether, whether this mediates the relationship between depression and heart disease is unclear at this time. So very quickly, not to bore you with the details, why are depressed patients so vulnerable for heart disease? and why once you've had an MI, is depression so deadly? And there are fundamentally three major findings, maybe four. The first is there is a decrease in heart rate variability in depressed patients, which is a measure of the parasympathetic control of the heart. And heart rate variability is fundamentally a measure of the heart's ability to respond to physiological demand. So we know that depressed patients already have that risk factor. Secondly, they fundamentally have a clotting diathesis due to um, several um, um, uh, steps in the platelet clotting cascade that are directed more towards a clotting diathesis in depressed patients. Thirdly, there is in many depressed patients an increase in sympathetic and sympathoadrenal activity, which also likely contributes to the risk. So this is a study we published um, uh, 15 years ago, um, and this has been confirmed by multiple other groups that depressed patients are much more likely to, to activate their platelets. This is the very first step in platelet activation. These were drug-free depressed patients that we just asked to stand up as a challenge to their platelets. And they show this, this, this abnormality. Notice compared to the controls, their plates are already more activated at baseline and get even more activated after the orthostatic challenge. This is a humongous finding by the Toronto group showing that depressed patients with ischemic heart disease have huge elevations in two um, uh, markers of platelet 
um, uh, uh, clotting. One is, this is an intermediate step in the plotting, uh, uh, clotting cascade. Uh, this is platelet factor four and beta thromboglobulin. Notice the elderly controls don't show this and the elderly patients with ischemic heart disease don't show it. It's only the patients with both ischemic heart disease and depression. And what's amazing about these patients is that they were all on aspirin. So aspirin wasn't powerful enough to block um, their heightened platelet clotting cascade. Now SSRIs on the other hand may well um, have that capacity. So here's a paper uh, out of where else USA Today it says Zoloft alleviates the sticky situation in blood. And this was part of a large study we and others were involved in that was sponsored by Pfizer to determine whether sertraline treatment in patients with comorbid depression and heart disease uh, were, um, uh, was effective. And I'll get, I'll get back to that in a minute if we have time. Um, there's the heart rate variability data. I'm not gonna go over that. Yeah, so this is the Pfizer-sponsored SATHART study. It had um, a large number of co-investigators. And what, what we found was there was an overall reduction in mortality in the patients on sertraline, um, a reduction in myocardial infarction. None of these individual reductions were statistically significant, but the total mortality finding uh, certainly was. And there have been other studies that have now shown that SSRIs can reduce morbidity and mortality in patients post-MI. Um, uh, this is a study that also shows that cognitive behavior therapy uh, shown here in the round circles is quite effective in the treatment of depression post-MI and better than um, supportive stress management. The caveat about uh, uh, the treatment uh, with SSRIs in patients with uh, post-myocardial infarction has to do with the concerns about upper GI bleeding. So if patients have a history of upper GI bleeding, then you need to be uh, uh, somewhat um, uh, cautious about the use of SSRIs because of their antiplatelet effects. And you know that patients um, on SSRIs uh, will often say to you that they have noticed some black and blue uh, uh, marks on their arms or legs because they have this easy bruisability because of the antiplatelet effects of SSRIs. So in patients who have a history of GI bleed, um, one ought to be a little cautious. Secondly, if patients are on NSAIDs, then the combination of SSRIs and NSAIDs will also uh, result in an increased um, uh, risk of GI bleeding. So one ought to be cautious about that. But in general, um, uh, SSRIs are safe and effective in treating patients post um, uh, MI. So I can't believe I'm actually going to get this done in the appropriate amount of time. So um, this is sort of a summary of the sort of pathogenesis of comorbid um, medical disorders and psychiatric disorders. And again, to sort of review for you where we started from in the beginning. So there are a number of medical disorders that have high rates of depression and a number of medical disorders that occur in high rates um, in, in depressed patients. I haven't talked to you about many of them. I'll give you some other examples. Migraines. Um, the, pre the prevalence rate of migraines in depressed patients is far uh, uh, exceed the general population. And then secondly, um, the prevalence of depression in patients with migraine far exceeds the general population. And we went over that whole list of uh, cardiovascular diseases, neurological diseases, autoimmune diseases, uh, and cancers. We know that health behaviors contribute 
um, uh, uh, two uh, uh, risk for a number of medical disorders, and that unfortunately, depressed patients tend to engage in these behaviors. We could add alcohol abuse here as well, which is clearly a risk factor for esophageal uh, cancer, obviously smoking and lung cancer. We talked about biological commonalities. I believe uh, that there is evidence that the inflammation associated with depression creates a more favorable milieu for metastatic disease. If you think about why does one part of the liver receive a MET uh, compared to another part of the liver? And it looks like that local milieu of inflammation is probably uh, a contributing factor. And we talked about how certain effects of antidepressants like weight gain, think of mertazapine, think about atypical antipsychotic augmentation uh, can result uh, in, in, in medical factors um, like obesity, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. And then we talked about the, the biology of um, medical disorders um, like stroke, um, uh, MS, Huntington's disease uh, that, that are, create brain changes that create a fertile environment uh, for, for depression um, to ensue. And then we also talked about um, um, other psychosocial factors. Um, this gives you a even um, broader picture because um, I wanted to finish um, to acknowledge the fact that everything we do is complicated. And, you know, that's why we're in mental health, because in all deference to other medical specialties, you know, we have 100 billion neurons in the brain and probably twice as many glial cells. And so we have a lot of behavioral factors, emotional factors, cognitive factors um, that contribute both to psychiatric and medical uh, illness, uh, truly a multifactorial uh, process. Um, and so when we treat patients with comorbid medical disorders, um, we have to think about all of these spheres. You know, depressed patients aren't an adherent to their medical treatment. You know, I was shocked to discover in working with cancer patients, you would think if you had cancer, you would be adherent to the cancer therapy. Well, not really. Many patients with cancer are not adherent. And so this complex world that we live in means we have to work very closely in collaborative care models to take the very best care of our patients that we can. So I'm gonna stop. I've actually finished with 30 seconds to spare. And I'm more than happy to take um, chat questions. I wish I could be with you. Um, I, I wanna make one final comment of one minute. Um, I've been going into our hospital and I've been just thunderstruck with how incredibly stressed our um, staff is. And I'm not talking about our psychiatric staff only. I'm talking about our nurses, our physicians, um, across the board, the amount of burnout I'm seeing um, because of COVID, um, you know, I was in the hospital on Monday and we didn't have any ICU beds left. And I sat down with a group of nurses and physicians. Um, and these are just not the kind of people that will ever come for mental health help. And I sat down with them for an hour in the break room and half of them actually started crying about the fact that they hadn't had a vacation. They were working double shifts. They were worried about their families. They didn't see any end in sight. Um, and you know we're all in this together and I know you're seeing it also. So we are gonna get through this, but my heart goes out to all of you that are in the midst of this chronic stressor. So, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I could see you all. Um,
and hopefully you don't need that code anymore. And I'll be glad to um, take questions if you'd like. Dr. Namorov, thank you so, so much. No disappointments here. That was a wonderful presentation. And what you've presented to us really challenges us to think about how do we structure ourselves? Where do we go from here? Um, staying out of our silos obviously is critical both to the better health of our patients and for ourselves. Um, so we have a lot of homework to do and a lot of thinking to do based on what you presented today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna look at the chat box and I'm not seeing anything here. I think you have wowed everyone. Um, well, I, so I, do any, want to any any say hello. I do want to say hello to Dr. Schwartz, you know, on this, on this day of atonement. Hey, Charlie. Great to see you. It's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in so long, and you look well. And so do you. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, ditto. Great talk. So please say hello to all of my friends there uh, and in the area. I wish I could be with you. Uh, and I will look forward to maybe coming up uh, next year and being together. So um, please be safe and well. And you, and we'd love to have you back in person. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Oh yeah, okay, I see it. I got a question here. How is this perceived by your medical colleagues? So, you know, it's very interesting. Um, at the University of Texas, uh, Dell Medical School, um, at the Dell Children's Medical Center, we have for the first time I've ever experienced a truly collaborative care model in which psychiatry and psychology are embedded in every single service. So it's not a consultative service. It's that I literally have a mental health faculty member in cardiology, oncology, hematology, rheumatology, et cetera. And it's been eye-opening about how well this works. So instead of getting a consultation, these people um, live in the cardiac unit and that's where they live. And they go to every team meeting and every patient is discussed. And in that setting, um, there, the, the old questions about, um, you know, mental health care and psychiatry, um, you know, they, it just doesn't come up at all. So in the more um, um, traditional model, what it really takes is a, um, a leader in the non-psychiatric physician group. So, you know, there was an orthopedic surgeon when I was at Emory who was at the Medical College of Georgia and he had suffered with depression and he sort of became a spokesperson and he would go with me to like orthopedic surgery meetings and he would talk about his depression. Um, the same with cardiology. When I was at Duke, Chris O'Connor was a cardiologist. He really believed in the data. Um, and that's what it takes. One of the biggest challenges I think we've had, surprisingly enough, has been in the women's health space um, in, in terms of obstetrics and gynecology, because fundamentally, 30 to 40 percent of women in the United States have their OBGYN as their primary care doctor. And most traditional OBGYN programs have virtually no mental health as part of the training on the one hand. And let's remember that most OBGYNs went into that field because they're fundamentally surgeons, not trying to be um, uh, too stereotyped. So we've had a lot of um, uh, difficulty initially, uh, and now it's a lot better in educating um, a gynecologist um, particularly in the gynecological oncology side, uh, but also obstetricians about postpartum depression, depression during pregnancy. And I remember giving a talk at the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology about depression during pregnancy and this sort of elderly um, uh, OBGYN doc came up to me afterwards and he said, we were always told that there isn't any depression depression and pregnancy. 
that that's a time when everybody, women are happy. And I said, well, you know, that's not what the data would show. So to answer your question, I think it's a, it's an ongoing problem. And the way to deal with it is through CME, um, as well as through, um, it's really sort of an on the ground battle. And, but um, it's eminently will, winnable. We have an additional question here, Dr. Nemiroff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Phenomenal. Do you suggest we change our approach to treating patients with mental illness, with medical comorbidities, chronic illness, or overall? Well, so, you know, let's uh, be honest and admit to ourselves that when our patients with primary psychiatric disorders go to an emergency room, they're simply not taken as seriously as patients without psychiatric disorders. And so, you know, the, the classic view that, you know, somebody who has in their EMR treatment for an anxiety disorder comes in with chest pain, they're less likely to get um, a cardiac workup. Um, and, and our patients by and large have suffered with that stigma with lots of tragedy associated with it. Um, so this again um, has to do with education. And I think we, we need to do better. You know, in the old days when, when, when Hal and I were young and we were on call, you know, our patients would have charts that we would measure by their height. You know, someone would come, their past chart, you know, they had 40 admissions they had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and their chart was two feet high. And when an ER doc would see that, they would just immediately consider all of those symptoms to be um, factitious. But as we all learned, our patients for lots of reasons that you all understand develop heart disease, stroke, cancer, et cetera. So this is yet another example of parity. And it's up to us to be proactive for our patients. Thank you. I think we've exhausted all of the questions and comments. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, all the questions and comments in the chat box. And unless I see anything else, I wanna thank you again for your time. I do hope you can come back on the presentation on childhood abuse and neglect. Um, exceptional presentation. So hopefully we can do that next year. Thank you so much for your time. I think you have challenged us and we look forward to uh, rising to that challenge. Thank you, Cynthia, Harold. See you all. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye Charlie. Great to see you.